Uh, the, the next person we will hear from, you've already heard from at the opening of this meeting, is Steve Esty. And Steve, this is, this is an appropriate uh, transfer because Steve worked uh, extraordinarily hard as part of the Canadian delegation to make sure that the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was uh, enshrined and then ratified by as many countries as possible. He has spent uh, years and years in the disability rights movement, working for Disabled Peoples International and other related organizations. But mostly he's a good friend. He's just absolutely unstoppable in everything he does and, and has been for us in AIDS Free World one of the strongest and most impressive allies. And he's going to talk, I think, about the convention and anything else that comes to his mind and will engage in the same kind of conversation that was had with uh, Judy Human. Steve. I have to, I, I'd, I'd like to lower the microphone just a little. I don't usually use a cane, but Steve and I have been doing a little soft shoe together, and we want to. <laughs> if only I'd brought a hat, it would be perfect. Stephen's been teasing me this morning about being so short that even standing on the podium, they're not going to be able to get me on the video, but I hope it, they're telling me it's working back there. I'm here, okay. I, I've, uh, I've been on panels with Judy Human before, and for that reason, I didn't prepare a long speech because I knew that probably there wouldn't be much time at the end. That's fine. Judy has wonderful things to say, and I'm happy we had a chance to, to hear that stuff. What I did want to do for a couple of minutes is try to share with you some of my experiences when I was in a similar situation to where you folks are today. And that brings me back 10 years ago this summer, and Janet is sitting in the back there, and I've been thinking a lot about this. And I drove down here from Nova Scotia on the east coast of Canada with my family for the last, we've been driving for the last three days, and I've been thinking a lot about this meeting, but also thinking about the 10 years that have passed since we first came together to start to negotiate the CRPD. <coughs> and in many ways, the situation that we were in with disability organizations 10 years ago in New York at the UN is very analogous to where you folks are here today as you sit and plan to try to engage and to try to get the attention of this UN AIDS meeting over the course of the next week. It's a huge, huge task. You've been selected for this task because you've been recommended by disability leaders in your countries as people who are engaged and enthusiastic and committed. And it's going to take all of your enthusiasm and all of your commitment to be successful over the course of the next week. Now, I want to just go back to August of 2000 and, what, 2002, when we first came together at the UN for the first meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee, because in a lot of ways, it's really similar. That meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee was basically a meeting that was called to consider whether or not there should be a Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. It wasn't a meeting to say, okay, we're gonna write a convention and we're gonna move forward. Instead, it was a meeting that happened because most of the countries in the world couldn't think of any polite way to say, no, we don't want to have this meeting. The government of Mexico introduced a resolution into the General Assembly in December of 2001 that said we should strike a committee to consider whether or not we ought to have a Convention on the Rights of the People with Disabilities. Two times previous to that, countries had introduced resolutions into the General Assembly to say we ought to have a convention for people with disabilities. On both of those occasions, they failed to get support, 
and it didn't move forward in the General Assembly. But the Mexican brilliant folks that they are decided instead to say, not we should have a convention for people with disabilities, but rather we should have a meeting to talk about whether we should have a convention for people with disabilities. And for those of you who are students of the UN, you'll know that there's seldom a time when there's a, a suggestion to have a meeting at the UN and somebody says, no, we shouldn't have that meeting. It's a place where meetings take place. It's a house of meetings. So the Mexicans said we should have a meeting to talk about a convention, People heard meeting and said, oh, great, meeting, we'll move forward, we'll have a meeting. And that's where we were 10 years ago. We had this meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee. Stephen talked this morning about the fact that the document that's just come out from UNAID, the 140-page document, fails completely to mention people with disabilities. This after commitments from the highest levels of UN aid to talk about disability over a number of years. So clearly we need to keep the pressure on. And that's why I'm saying it's analogous to where we were at the meeting in 2002 because <coughs> At that time, the governments came together, delegations from around the world came together, and I think, you know, if I'm honest about it, most countries, most delegations came to that meeting in 2002 with the agenda to put this thing to rest, to just say no, to find a way to finesse it, to say we're not going to move forward, with the Disability Convention. I remember conversations with diplomats from many countries around the world in which they gave the most passionate descriptions of a thing that I'd never heard of before called treaty fatigue. They talked about treaty fatigue and about the UN system and about how there just wasn't the resources, there weren't the resources to move forward with another convention. There were too many conventions already and besides People with disabilities are people already, so they were covered by these other conventions. So that was a big argument to say, we don't need to have another convention for people with disabilities because you're covered by these other conventions. Now, as it happens, the year or two before that, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights had done a study that looked at the entire UN system, the entire human rights architecture, all of the human rights treaties in the UN system, and said, okay, we're hearing that people with disabilities are covered by all of these other conventions. So what we want to do, what the study did, was reached out to try to find evidence of people with disabilities being reported on in these other human rights conventions. And two European academics surveyed all of the countries in the world to say, okay, you report on the Convention on the Rights of, uh, or the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Women's Convention and all of the other human rights conventions. Tell us where you are with reporting on disability in that, and almost nobody could point to a specific example of where people with disabilities were referred to. So it turned out that in fact people with disabilities were not being covered off or being attended to in the, in the already existing human rights structure in the UN. And I think that, again, I'm trying to make the point what we're going to hear a lot uh, this week, and we're in the workshop that we're going to, and we're listening to people talk about, people are going to be saying things like, oh, we don't need to specifically talk about people with disabilities because you're going to be covered off by all of the other work that we're doing. We're setting up programs and people with disabilities will naturally be included. Or as some colleagues have said here this morning, there's no need to include people with disabilities for all of the reasons that have come up around the table in the myths discussion, but we know as enthusiastic, dedicated disability advocates that there is every reason under the sun to include people with disabilities and to include us vigorously in all of the discussions 
related to AIDS and all of the discussions around the table, around the, the whole meeting, the, the UN AIDS session over the coming week. We've talked for years about trying to get disability onto this agenda. We're moving forward slowly, step by step, and I just want to say that we're at the same point on the, uh, in my view, we're at the same point on the AIDS agenda where we were on the human rights agenda more largely 10 years ago when we came together for the first meeting of the CRPD. And what did we do with those meetings? Well, we did what we're doing here today. We brought young, committed, dynamic, disabled people from around the world to the UN, to that meeting, and it's interesting because that meeting was primarily a meeting of diplomats and of government officials, most of whom had never met a person with a disability before. And in many ways, it's analogous to what we're going to see here in Washington this week. What we did with the young people and with the disabled people who were at that meeting is we encouraged them. We met like we're meeting here. We did training. We talked about how to engage. We talked about how to get people's attention. We talked about how to make noise, as was said earlier today. And that's what we need to do again over the course of the next week. And I want to just say finally, and I'm mindful of time here, but I just want to say finally that one of the key strategies, if you will, that I found to be useful in, the, in this process of trying to develop allies, trying to get people to support our issues, to support disability issues, is to find things that are perhaps of interest to those other to people who are, don't come from the disability community. So for example, one of the things that we did to try to engage mainstream disability or mainstream human rights organizations during the work of the ad hoc committee was we talked about the reporting process that was going to be put forward with the, with the new UN convention. We talked about the fact that there was a concern that the reporting process for the CRPD would be less robust, would be less strong than were other human rights treaties. And if we did that, then there would be an erosion of the process, an erosion of reporting that could happen. So we were able to reach out to talk to other organizations, human rights organizations, and say, come work with us, talk to us about the disability treaty, and help us to ensure that the reporting process that countries commit to with the CRPD is as strong and robust as is the reporting process for other treaties and other conventions. And that was something that was quite effective, we found. In any case, I don't want to go on anymore. I think we're coming up to lunch. I will open the floor and say, ask if anybody has any questions or comments. I'd be happy to hear from you. So why don't I do that? So open the floor, questions, comments, criticisms, jokes. Hmm. Hi, yeah, it's a young lady from Jamaica. Can you get a microphone over here? Hi, I'm Sharmali from Jamaica. With regards to the UN Convention, I know that Jamaica signed on to the UN Convention, but what I'd like to know, each country has a specific way in which they ratify the Convention, or is it a set procedure for each country? That's the question. Jamaica actually both signed and ratified on the very same day, the first day that the convention opened for signature in 2008, and it was the only country in the world to do that. 
So yes, indeed, there are different processes in different countries. My own country, Canada, as Stephen said, ratified in 2010. Every country has a different process, but it's a two-step process. Okay. First of all, there's the signing of the convention, and about 160 countries around the world. I can be corrected on this, perhaps, but Allison, do you know off the top of your head is about 160 countries that signed the convention? I don't think it's 160. Mm -hmm. Okay, somewhere in that ballpark. In any case, about 160 countries have signed, but far fewer have ratified. What the pr difference is, is when you sign, then you agree to review your own domestic laws and policies to ensure that they're in compliance with the convention. And once that review takes place, then it's possible to ratify. So in some countries, that can happen quite quickly, as was apparently the case in Jamaica, whereas in other countries it takes some years, as was the case in Canada, and as Judy was saying, the case here in the US. Okay. Other questions, comments? Yes, Gan Ganesh, can we get a uh, microphone here on the inner table? Canada signed <coughs> the convention in 2008, but has not yet ratified and they have not signed the optional protocol. My question is if, because we are advocating currently for them to ratify the convention, but what are the penalties or the obligations of a state party when they ratified the convention if they do not promote or fulfill the rights of persons with disability within that country? Because the optional protocol, you could go, you know, exhaust whatever laws are there in the country and go to the committee. But if they just sign and ratify the convention, what, what then course of action could be taken by someone or a group, or what obligations are the, the government are obligated to? Well, that's quite a question. Let me see if I can do justice to it. I happen to come from a country that has signed and ratified the convention, but won't touch the optional protocol with a 10-foot pole. And the disability community in Canada has been lobbying on this and talking about it for a number of years. When we signed the convention in 2007 or 2008, whenever, it, the, whenever we did that, there was no discuss there was no signature of the optional protocol and the disability community was very frustrated in Canada by that we had a lot of meetings about it and what we were told by officials in foreign affairs was that politically there was simply no way that the current Canadian government was going to be prepared to sign or ratify the optional protocol so what we decided to do um, but was focus on what we could achieve in the short term, and that was ratification of the convention. I mean, these conventions live over decades, and I think that you need to make political decisions in terms of your own domestic situation about what's achievable in the short term and what may be achievable in a longer term, and focus on what you can achieve in the short term. So if, I mean, we had, the, I can remember a discussion very specifically about this in Canada, about the optional protocol and whether the disability community should make a big production about the fact that the Canadian government hadn't signed that. And we basically confronted the reality that if we did that, then we would likely poison the environment entirely around the convention and we wouldn't get the country to ratify the convention itself. And others can talk more knowledgeably about this than I, but I would say that there is significant value in signing and ratifying the convention alone. It's better to ratify the optional protocol, but the optional protocol is simply a mechanism that allows for individual complaints to be brought forward to the UN treaty body. And that's only one very small part of 
what countries have to do in terms of meeting their obligations under the convention. Countries have to report in a much larger way, and in fact, in the two or three years that the CRPD committee has been meeting, there have been several efforts to move forward specific uh, cases under the optional protocol, but they're almost always ruled out for procedural reasons. So. I wouldn't say give up on the optional protocol at all, but I would encourage you to focus your energy on ratification of the convention itself, because that we found to be a very useful first step. Why, why I ask the question is that currently we have a Persons with Disability Act in Guyana, but most, or if not all, the it's not really anti-discriminatory. It's just obligations on the part of the government ministries with no penalties or timeline. So basically, you, you could happen in never worry, not you know at the present. You could take a very very long time for things to happen. Okay. So thank you very much. Okay. Other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask my question. My name is Texon Zimbudziana, and I'm from Africa, one of the developing countries, Zimbabwe. My question is based on the UNCRPD. Is there any other alternative way that we can use to influence or to make our country ratify this UNCRPD? And also, is there any grace period given to those countries that have indeed sent the optional protocol. You ask, I'm, I'm not sure I'm following you. I'm, I'm reading on the screen here. Are you asking about ways that you can encourage your country, which is Zimbabwe, to ratify the convention and the optional protocol? Yes, any other ways that we might use to make our country ratify this? <laughs> Sometimes working with captioning is less than a perfect thing. Now, I'm not sure that I, I understand your question. Has, can I ask you this? Has Zimbabwe ratified the CRPD? Not yet. It's still an ongoing process. So then the essential question is about getting Zimbabwe to ratify the CRPD? Y yes, we are seeing. Uh, is there any other means that we can use to make the... Zimbabwe government signed the UNC RPD. Or is there any other alternative that um, the other I countries think there who are people in the room who are a lot more familiar with the political situation in Zimbabwe than I am, probably yourself <laughs> included? So I, I don't really know the, a specific answer to that. What I can say to you that is that on the DPI website, which you'll find online at www.dpi.org, there is a toolkit that we developed for ratification, for our organization to, to uh, plan ratification campaigns on both the convention and on the optional protocol. I'm not sure that responds to your question. Maybe we can talk at the lunchtime and I can be a bit clearer about things, okay? Uh, I am from Ethiopia and I just want to share briefly our experience on the process of influencing the ratification of the convention. I am from a, a development organization called World Vision and we work closely with disabled people organizations. And in a number of occasions, uh, I, I want to highlight the work of the, the disabled people organizations on this. They invite NGOs, they invite every actor in the country in influencing the government. And in a number of occasions, we were approached as a development organization um, uh, to arrange uh, to arrange some kind of stage so that uh, government people, people from the parliament and uh, disabled people come together and discuss on the benefits of the convention. And uh, this has helped a lot. Uh, every um, 
opportunity the, the, the disabled people organizations get, uh, they invite the, the standing committee, it, we call it the social standing committee in the House of Representatives. They are the ones who, who, who ratify and who have the say. So one thing it's good is who has the power uh, to do what and who can help you to, to get those people and to influence them. And a number of sessions were arranged uh, together with other organizations and influential people also. The disabled people organizations were the ones who were organizing. And then this has really helped in, in 2010, uh, uh, the convention was ratified by, uh, by the parliament. Thank you. Sure, yeah, quickly. Okay, other Go ahead. Uh, mine is uh, a question, and I am also from Ethiopia. And my question is that I know that the uh, disability movement in, I in Canada is uh, strong, and I would love to know uh, how is the political representation of persons with disabilities in Canada? I mean, even in the countries where uh, this convention has rat has been ratified. Uh, it's very difficult to see that persons with disabilities are represented in different levels of government, and I would love to know your experience. And the other question is also, especially for persons uh, who are visually impaired, in the process of election for political uh, competitions or for political issues, uh, we need someone just to be with us and uh, put our election, which is really a privacy issue, and how uh, are these persons who are visually impaired managing in the election process in Canada? Thank you. It's interesting around political participation. There's a provision in the CRPD, Article Number 29, that talks about the right to political participation, and it, elaborate, and it elaborates very specifically a whole bunch of ideas around political participation, whether that's accessible balloting procedures or participation in political parties or the right to uh, the right to stand for office. In some countries in Africa, there are actual seats designated in the Houses of Parliament for people with disabilities. That's certainly not the case in Canada. If there were, I'd be in Ottawa now. You can count on it, but that's not the case. I, uh, I think that... Uh, you know, participation, can it, and you talk about the disability movement in Canada being strong and so on, and in some ways it is, that, that's true, but it hasn't been very integrated into the political movement, and we're doing a fair amount of work trying to get people with disabilities more involved in politics in Canada. And the convention has been a key to that. It's a key to get politicians to talk to us and so on. So hopefully, through the CRPD, we can use that, and Article 29 specifically, to advance the issue of participation. Mr. Lewis, come on up. I, it's time for me to uh, soft you off the stage here, I think. Mm.